approach to these texts. Even though it would be very easy for a historian to simply set aside the sorts of stories that we find here, they have angelic announcements and tales of the miraculous, and we encounter stories of miraculous births throughout ancient literature as a way of highlighting a person's importance. And so it would be very easy to simply set these aside and do nothing with them. But it's worth looking at the details, because sometimes what we're dealing with are dramatized and um, supernaturalified, if one can coin a phrase, narratives that are based on, or at least embed, some actual historical knowledge. In the case of Matthew and Luke's Gospels and their stories of the birth and infancy of Jesus and the events running up to that uh, miraculous conception, most people are familiar with a version of the story that runs the details from both sources together and combines them. Uh, particularly if you've ever been to a Christmas pageant in a church where you've seen children either dressed as sheep or dressed as shepherds with towels on their heads and various other things, then you probably know a version at which uh, shepherds and wise men all crowd around the manger at the same time. And in fact, there are important differences, and we need to ask ourselves whether there are not, in fact, beyond the differences between the Gospels, some actual discrepancies, and things which simply do not fit naturally together. It's one thing to point out that Matthew's Gospel has the Magi, and Luke's Gospel has the Shepherds. Those are just differences and not necessarily inconsistencies. But when we look at the two Gospels and try to follow the thread of things such as geographical movements, we'll find that we find real, genuine historical problems which go beyond differences to what at least potentially might be called contradictions. I think it's worth thinking about Matthew's and Luke's stories as a bit like two different jigsaw puzzles. If we think of two portraits of Jesus, each of them might depict Jesus in a particular way. If we were to combine all the different pieces from those two puzzles into one box and try and make one big puzzle out of them, we might find that we couldn't do it. Matthew's story, Luke's story, each of them tells a story which is, at least for the most part, internally consistent. It's particularly when we try to fit the two together that we find problems. And to just mention a couple here, um, I'll actually trace them on a map for you in a moment. What was the hometown of Jesus' parents? We see some issues there. And what was the date of Jesus' birth? Most people assume it was the year zero, even though there isn't a year zero in our calendar. And despite what might be the next guess, it's not the year one. The death of Herod takes place, took place uh, around 4 BC. Uh, we have a number of sources and references to astronomical events that allow us to date that fairly precisely. And Jesus' birth is placed by Matthew's Gospel probably roughly two years before that, because uh, Herod is depicted as inquiring of the Magi when they saw the star appear. So at the very least, the impression that's given between that, the fact that they're in a house, the text refers to a child and not a baby. Most have thought of the Magi arriving some when Jesus was around two years old, but certainly not a newborn. Uh, at least that's the impression we're given. In Luke's Gospel, the census under Quirinius is given as the catalyst for uh, Jesus' family going to Bethlehem and his being born there. And the census of Quirinius is also something that's possible to date fairly precisely. It occurred in 6 AD. And it was that census which marked the transfer to direct Roman rule, which sparked off what we know of as the Zealot Movement, right? it was because of opposition to the numbering of the people. There's a whole backstory to that uh, involving David and being condemned for holding a census and things of that sort, which we need not go into for the purpose of this talk. It was a famous event. It was a controversial event. And it happens when Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, is 
deposed from the throne, a direct Roman rule was instituted. And so it doesn't seem possible that Jesus could have been born before the death of Herod the Great and sometime during the census of Quirinius. And we have 10 or 12 years between the dates that each of those, Matthew and Luke, would seem to imply. That's not the only problem. And if we try to trace the movements that Jesus' family goes through in each of these Gospels, we'll find that we get a very, very different impression. In Matthew's Gospel, the first reference we have to a specific place, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, so it starts with, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea. You have the Magi arriving, Herod wants to slaughter the infants, and so the family of Jesus is said to flee to Egypt. After Herod dies, we're told that they wanted to return to the land of Israel, and clearly they wanted to return to Judea. And that becomes clear because we're told that uh, they wanted to return, but because Archelaus was on the throne, right, so clearly he hasn't been deposed yet at that point, uh, instead, right, even though they want to go to Bethlehem, they try to go to Bethlehem, they try to go to Judea, which is where they're from in Matthew's Gospel. And only because they're afraid of Herod's son, who's on the throne, they go to Galilee and settle in Nazareth. And so the impression that we get from the Gospel of Matthew is that if we look at the Gospel of Luke, they start in Galilee. They go up to Bethlehem because of the census, and even though the census doesn't apply to Galilee, which is not under direct Roman rule at this period. Even if we give Luke the benefit of the doubt, say that maybe Joseph had a claim to territory there, wanted to uh, be registered in the census, or maybe was originally from there, or something like that, even though it's not the impression that he gives. But if we, even if we give him the benefit of the doubt, we still find there are discrepancies. Right? If we ask how long do they stay in Bethlehem, we actually are given a fairly clear indication. Luke's Gospel talks about Jesus' circumcision, and then the family going up to Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices required by the law of Moses. And we read about these sacrifices and the purification after childbirth in Leviticus chapter 12. And it says that if a woman conceives and bears a male child, she's ceremonially unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, the child is circumcised. Her time of blood purification shall be 33 days. And so... A little over a month, perhaps, passes before uh, Jesus' family goes to Jerusalem, and we're told by Luke that after they've done everything that the law of the law, the law of the Lord requires, they return to Nazareth, which is where they are from. And so the geographical movements between these two texts are very different and give a very different impression. And when we we add to this the discrepancy between the dates dates which, even if our dating was off, are not in the same time period. One has to do with the transfer to direct Roman rule after Herod's son is deposed. The other has to do with a story set during the time of Herod the Great. And so there's a discrepancy here. And while there have been lots of attempts to minimize the discrepancies or even harmonize them, what we end up with then is a story that, by combining the two and forcing the two together, is not the story told in either of these Gospels. It seems to me that this attempt at harmonization is, in fact, an effort in futility, an exercise in futility. And so, I think the appropriate approach is to realize that each of these Gospel authors may have had some information. Uh, they knew that Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth. They had the conviction, whether based on some actual tradition or based on the conviction that scripture predicted that the Messiah would have to be born in Bethlehem. And independently of one another, it would seem, put together a story that explained how Jesus of Nazareth could have been born in Bethlehem. And so 
a historian really is going to see this as problematic. The claim that Jesus is from Nazareth is not problematic because it's not something that someone would make up. If we ask what would people make up, it's precisely a birth in Bethlehem. Right? And attributing that to someone who's known as Jesus of Nazareth, and people were normally known after their place of birth. And so the most natural view would be that Jesus was in fact born in Nazareth. Trying to fit these accounts together seems like an exercise in futility. And so it would seem much better to ask what are the major themes in these Gospels? One major theme in Matthew's Gospel, which we encounter already in the infancy stories, is fulfillment of scripture. And if one actually reads these texts in their original context, we'll see that treating any of those texts as predictions about Jesus doesn't work. Um, The one in Isaiah is very famous, but people who only know the few verses that Matthew quotes don't realize that the child that was to be born was to serve as a sign to King Ahaz about the Assyrian threat that existed in his time. And so it would have been no comfort to King Ahaz if what Isaiah had meant was hundreds of years from now, a child named Jesus will be born. In Hosea, it's clearly talking about Israel being called out of Egypt. And in Jeremiah, the weeping of Rachel for her children is weeping for exiles who, in the context, are said explicitly to be destined to return from exile to their homeland. And Matthew 2.23 is the trickiest of all because it doesn't seem to actually refer to a text that we can identify. And certainly doesn't do so clearly, even if it had some text or other in mind. Some have treated Matthew as playing fast and loose with scripture, trying to pull a fast one on readers, but it seems as though he intended people to pick up on these scriptural echoes. And so directing people to passages which don't mean what you claim they mean doesn't seem like it's going to be very effective or very persuasive. And so it may be that the problem is that modern people reading only Matthew in the quotes assume that what he means by fulfillment of prophecy is that these things were predicted in earlier texts and then happened. What Matthew seems to be talking about is in fact something more like what we would call typology. And so if somebody says to you, well, Jesus fulfills all these prophecies, it's miraculous, and things like that, they probably haven't ever actually read the Bible carefully. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to actually look up these passages and ponder what Matthew's doing with them. Uh, But it doesn't seem that there's any way that we can treat them as predictions. And we see this typology in Matthew's depiction of Jesus as a new Moses, something that will continue even as far as um, him depicting Jesus as going up on a mountain and delivering teaching, which is compared and contrasted with things that Moses supposedly said earlier. In Matthew's infancy story, there are details which resonate with the story in Exodus, killing of infants, uh, the birth of a deliverer, and those who knew this story would have picked up on those echoes. If they knew the traditions of Jewish storytelling that expanded on those details, they would have picked up on other resonances as well. In one famous retelling, Pharaoh commands that male Hebrew infants be killed because prophets have predicted to him that a deliverer is to be born. And so that would have made the parallels with Herod even closer. And once one has these parallels in mind, then one notices the discrepancy, right? That in Exodus, Moses flees from Egypt. In Matthew, Jesus and his family flee to Egypt, and they're running away from one who bears the title King of the Jews. And so Matthew is depicting a what's wrong with this picture sort of scenario, where ironically, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, the Deliverer, has to flee from the land of Israel to Egypt, whereas the natural flow would have been the other direction. And so Matthew offers this as criticism of his contemporaries. The point doesn't seem to be to tell a story that provides 
purely historical details about Jesus, but to highlight Jesus as a new Moses. If we turn to Luke's Gospel, there are things that we immediately note, whereas in Matthew, Jesus' interactions are with nobility, right? he's on the run from Herod, um, these magi, traditionally called kings, although there's no actual evidence of that in the text, but significant individuals right, who can afford to uh, bring lavish gifts from afar. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus and his family offer the sacrifice that in Leviticus is said to be for the poor. Um, it's poor shepherds who are made aware of the birth of this child. And if you're wondering what that is on the screen, um, it's a depiction of a first century peasant house and what it might have looked like. A manger is, in our time, found in a barn or a stable, right, if you find one at all. In Jesus' time, it wouldn't have been found in a stable necessarily. Um, very few peasant farmers would have been able to afford more than one house with one room in it. And mangers were often built into the floor. Uh, oftentimes it was a raised floor, and there'd be a lower area where you could bring animals in during the night to keep them safe, help warm the house. And so if we ask, according to Luke's Gospel, where was Jesus born? We shouldn't assume that it was in a stable. Um, in fact, that's an assumption that many make. Uh, but if you ask people from the Middle East, it seems very strange to them that Jesus' family would have gone and found an inn rather than relying on hospitality. Especially if, as Luke's narrative seems to presuppose, Joseph has some connection with this part of the world. And so, just as many people come to these texts with assumptions about their historicity, um, about the possibility of combining them, about what fulfillment of prophecy means, so too they come with assumptions about where manger is to be found, and that colors their reading of the text. And so let me close by emphasizing the importance of taking the text and setting it against a backdrop of culture and scriptural interpretation and ways of doing things from antiquity. Otherwise, we're prone to read the text and make assumptions about what fulfillment of prophecy means or where a manger is to be found. And even if we still can't bring these two texts together into a historical harmony, at the very least, we can make progress in understanding what they're trying to depict, what they're trying to say about Jesus, how they're introducing the major themes of each of these Gospels. Because the themes that begin in the infancy stories run throughout these Gospels. And it's best to view each of these stories not as a historical narrative, but as a symbolic highlighting of Jesus' importance, which also, through the specific details, introduces major themes in each of these Gospels.